Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Daniel Moyer. I'm a sales support trainer here at Briggs & Stratton Simplified Power. Uh, as we're waiting for a few more people to jump into the meeting, I want to just give a few housekeeping items. One of them is that this course is NAPS accredited. So if you're looking for your continuing education credits, uh, they will be available. At the end of this presentation, my email is going to pop up. And I'm going to share my email. Go ahead and email me your full first and last name. Spell it out for me, please, so that I know exactly what to put on your certificate if you're looking for those NABCEP credits. Another uh, housekeeping item we have is that if any time during this presentation you have a question or a comment, go ahead and put it into the Q&A uh, chat feature, the Q&A button. That'll either be at the top or the bottom of your screen to go ahead and join. So let's go ahead and get started. What we're talking about today is uh, achieving true safety in energy storage, UL 9540A fire testing. And I think it's going to be a, a, a very important topic, these, these UL testings on these battery energy storage systems as they become more prevalent. Why does it matter? Well, these energy storage systems contain electrical and fire hazards, and they're really packed into these very tiny compact uh, packages. If you think about the, the technology battery has come along with, uh, we're now able to fit, you know, these are 3.8 kilowatt hour batteries you see on the bottom right, a little over 20 kilowatt hours in that picture. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about chemistry here in a little bit, how we leverage uh, lithium iron phosphate chemistry, which is really where I see a lot of the industry going now. Uh, and a lot of people are moving away from cobalt. But one thing that Simplify Power has always done from the beginning is leverage that safer chemistry. And we also have a safer form factor, the cylindrical cell. But really, as these systems become more common. Right now, uh, I have probably a couple energy storage systems in my neighborhood, uh, maybe a few here and there, but think about all the hard work that you and your company is doing over the next 10 or 20 years, that these are going to become much more prevalent. And these fire departments, our local uh, safety uh, people that are enforcing safety in our area, are having to keep up. Right? They want to know what to expect when there is a failure. And this 9540A uh, fire safety testing, which I'm going to explain uh, here coming up, is, is crucial because having a consistent test that is applied to all manufacturers across the board is really going to give um, the first responders, the firefighters, um, know exactly how to react to these systems and for us to integrate them and design them. They, firefighters should be concerned that these systems have a very high rele release rate of heat. And it's possible that even though they think they put the fire out, it could reignite. One uh, crucial thing to understand about these energy storage systems is that the thermal runaway can travel from cell to cell. Um, and every time you get one of these thermal runaway, you get a venting occurrence, which is venting this hazardous gas. A lot of times these battery fires are deep seated, right? It's in a metal cabinet, inside of a metal cabinet, inside of these metal cylindrical cells or pouch cells or prismatic cells. So it's really hard to get at actually what's burning. And these thermal runaway uh, unmitigated propagation can actually spread without oxygen. The, the batteries themselves contain all of the components necessary, the fuel and the oxygen to, to continue that thermal runaway. So really what you have to do is cool the system. And by cooling it, that means lots of water. And it's sometimes hard to get that cooling capacity there. I'm very mindful that the um, uh, National Fire Protection Agency is hosting a conference coming up. So the NFPA, uh, this is the agency that represents first responders and firefighters are very interested in these UL fire testing. And we will ha be having, and it's actually coming up. So if anybody finds themselves in uh, Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas coming up uh, next week, please uh, visit or attend this presentation done by Sequoia Cross. She's a uh, vice president of the energy storage here at Briggs and Stratton Simplify Power. And she's gonna be doing a talk, uh, basically the same talk that I'm doing today, just a little bit different uh, to these uh, NFPA 
code boards and the first responders that are showing up to this event. Uh, so it's really exciting. She gets to go to Mandalay Bay. I wish I was. Um, so if anybody is going to be attending that, maybe put it in the comments and let us know your thoughts. Backing up a little bit, I just want to let you know, Simplify Power really has been always known for its safe, simple, and proven technology. Safe is that we've always been that cobalt-free chemistry. Historically, cobalt batteries have been found in like what our cell phones, our laptops, and our EV cars. And that's because cobalt-based lithium-ion battery chemistries are very energy dense. That means that you could pack a lot of power into them. But when we're talking about home storage or stationary storage, being energy dense isn't as important. What matters most is cycle life and safety. So when we have something stationary and we're not carrying it around in our pockets or driving around with it, uh, we're really caring more about safety and longevity. And I do see and I understand that Tesla's, some of Tesla's newer cars are moving towards the uh, lithium iron phosphate chemistry. Uh, there's with that cobalt free chemistry, there's a much reduced uh, risk of unmitigated thermal runaway. So you can still have a thermal runaway in a lithium iron phosphate cell uh, or a lithium ferrous cell that it's what's going to happen after the thermal runaway event. Is it going to become an unmitigated kind of chain reaction where it spreads from cell to cell? Uh, kind of spoil alert to the end of this presentation. In our case, it doesn't. And we have those UL tests that we openly share to, to show that. Uh, UL 1642 is on the cell level. UL 1793 is on the battery module level. UL 9540 is on the system level. And we're going to talk a little bit about how UL 9540 uh, is informed by what happens in the UL 9540A uh, large-scale fire testing. We also hold UN Department of Transportation 38, 3480, which is to allows us to LTL or ground shift these batteries to everybody. And you uh, and Department of Transportation 38.3 is what allows us to air shift these batteries. We're proven. We're one of the few companies that actually are outliving the warranties that the batteries we make have. So, for example, I've gone to some recent shows at Solar Power International, InterSolar. A lot of people are coming into the energy storage marketplace right now. Uh, but we're one of the few people that actually can offer a 10-year warranty and then say that we have indeed been around longer than 10 years and we have some batteries outliving their warranty to really show that we're proven all around the world. And we had a great opportunity to be tested by the um, U.S. Army at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds, which is out there on the East Coast uh, in Maryland. And they put our batteries through some very rugged, kind of high vibration, high temperature um, testing environments before they ultimately chose to use our batteries to deploy in forward operating bases. And this is kind of a relatively long time ago. Um, you know, to think about the first Tesla power walls, the first kind of mainstream energy storage systems that are applied to grid interactive homes really didn't come into effect around 2015, uh, early, you know, mid 2010s. So this is a new kind of uh, industry as a kind of the wild west, I'd say a little bit, just like solar was maybe 20 years ago. So to have a company that's being behind you, the installer uh, that's proven, I think is important. We do have a business model that can demonstrate Profitability and social impact can coexist. It's the so-called a uh, triple bottom line, people, planet, and profits. And we do uh, have projects. And if you have a project that maybe you're interested in, whether it be uh, in another country here in the United States, uh, for communities of concern, for indigenous tribes, uh, let us know. Email me. My email is going to pop up at the end what your idea is. And we'll see if we can't donate to your program uh, usually we donate in the form of batteries. Uh, simple, we've made a battery that has been inverter agnostic for a long time. You can take one of our batteries, which you see down there at the bottom left, that's either the Phi or the Amplify battery, and go ahead and integrate it into an existing energy storage system. Maybe you got some Schneider, some Solar, or Victron, or, or maybe you got an old Xantrex or an old Trace inverter. 
Well, as long as you go in there and adjust the set points of that piece of equipment and charge controller, right? What do I care about is the low battery voltage cutouts, the bulk voltages, the float voltages, disable equalize. As long as you can go ahead and adjust those set points to treat our batteries the way they want to be treated, we can easily integrate our batteries into other people's equipment. And that's becoming less common in the industry. Of course, we do have our totally vertically integrated energy storage system that we're coming out with, which you see under there under the Simplify Energy Storage System. It's a six kilowatt inverter with a, a 4.98 battery uh, pack that's now outdoor rated that can be hung on the wall. And of course, but not last but not least is the app, right? All homeowners now and all installers, I also argue, want a great app. They want to be able to look at their phone, see where power is flowing to, where power is flowing from, what the uh, battery capacity is, maybe be able to set the system into a storm watch mode to hold in reserve any power rather than being a more of a great interactive system. So I, I was surprised to see how much money, time, and energy, uh, no pun intended, goes into the creation of these apps. There's no longer does the homeowner go out to the power shack and read the voltage on their batteries uh, from the, the front of their trace inverter or, or charge controller. Really what this, these energy storage systems are going to allow to do, like before, is provide resilience, provide a distributed asset and give people that energy security and help them save money. Really quickly, going to run through the timeline. Uh, we were founded back in 2010 as OES Energy, where we made these lithium iron phosphate battery packs for the film and broadcast energy in, uh, industry. We were able to relaunch a simplified power and started to introduce some of our residential products, like you see that access cabinet. More recently than that, uh, we developed some high voltage battery packs, and I'm really excited about the way uh, Solar 30K and the Solar 60K have come to market with their uh, three phase inverters that can now be leveraged in commercial and light industrial systems. Now, if you look carefully at that Solar 30K spec sheet, it wants DC battery input voltage of like 150 volts DC. So we can't really take our 48 volt battery packs that we've historically just run in parallel to power these newer, larger inverters. We have to take our same battery packs and put them in series, like you kind of see in that 2017, 2020 kind of server rack. That's our high voltage battery line. So stay tuned for some pre-packaged systems that are going to pair great with some of these higher voltage commercial inverters. One of the great things that recently happened was that we were acquired by Briggs & Stratton. I'm really excited about the acquisition. Uh, Briggs & Stratton has been one of these companies that's been around for 115 years. I remember as a kid in the 1980s mowing the lawn, you know, to earn my allowance. And what kind of lawnmower did my dad buy? Well, he bought a, a Briggs and Stratton, right? So it's one of those things where this, this company has a very well-known household name and brand and logo. So when it comes time to sit down at a kitchen table with a homeowner or a business owner, and you're trying to make that sale, if the homeowner or business owner recognizes who is making this system and understand that they have a proven American manufacturing expertise, they're more likely to buy. And as we mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, you go into some of these large uh, solar shows, you and I, the maybe the solar expert recognizes some of the other brands that are out there, but the average homeowner doesn't. So to have a, a name that somebody recognizes is important. Further than that, you know, the, the, the backing, the financial backing that Briggs & Stratton brings to the company is really going to allow us to have some upcoming technical innovations and, and stay at kind of the leading edge of this rapidly developing industry. We got grainy, great training and technical support. That's why you're here at this training today. Uh, and we're also having working on those lead gens. So we are here talking about the UL listings on these batteries. We'll get that uh, here in a second but I don't want to not mention uh, our great line of generators. So we have standby generators. What you're seeing there on the screen is a 26K, uh, which is one of the um, most powerful air-cooled generators on the U.S. market. 
Just to the left there, though, you're seeing our Power Protect 10, and we also make a Power Protect 12. So these are a little bit smaller scale generators, either uh, natural gas or um, propane. And I have an upcoming training, stay tuned for early July, where I'm going to talk about how these generators and that energy storage system can complement each other, right? How do we use a generator to charge up a battery bank, maybe when it's cloudy or nighttime, and then shut that generator off and use the stored power in that battery to reduce the runtime on that generator, reduce fuel costs, and frankly, reduce the loud noise that's bothering you and your neighbors. Stay tuned to that. I'm really excited about Briggs and Stratton um, and, and the partnership that uh, Simplify Power is bringing to it. Here's an opportunity. Uh, if you're an installer out there and you're looking to have this, uh, your company put on this map, at the end of this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, you can join our IQ program and get you on the map and, and show you where uh, everybody where you're at. This map really is just illustrating how wide a spread and a, what a global footprint um, Simplify Power has. We all know energy storage systems can provide backup, but it can also save us money. Specifically for business owners, there's a lot of peak shaving opportunities where during any time of the day, certain, uh, if you exceed a certain kilowatt threshold, well, we can program an energy storage system to shave those peaks off and not uh, get you that, that surge pricing. So it's a great opportunity, again, with that solar uh, 30K and 60K to start leveraging some of these uh, three phase applications with our batteries. Time of use rates have been common here in California for a long time, where during certain times of the day, energy is more expensive, what do we do? We store electricity generated from the sun during the day in our home's batteries. And then we discharge those batteries to cover the home's load, loads when uh, energy is expensive, like during the afternoon. One more recent innovation, and, and if anybody's from California, I'd love to hear you chime in here about the new net metering agreements. In California, it recently changed under NEM 2.0, that if during the day you produced, uh, say, a kilowatt hour of electricity and sent it to the grid, you would get one credit. You could then use that credit at night or over uh, winter, and it was a one-for-one -one credit. At the anniversary of the installation of your system, you would get a true-up bill, and you would either ideally owe the um, utility nothing, and they wouldn't owe you anything. Well, what recently just happened was NEM 3.0, a new net metering agreement. And what the new net metering agreement does is now during the day, you export a kilowatt hour to the grid, you get a fraction of a credit. And when you consume power at night, you're still paying that full credit. So really what this did is took out the uh, financial payback of a solar PV only system away from homeowners. So now you have to have an energy storage system to store that electricity during the day so that you're not having to buy expensive electricity at night. And, and I honestly think that this is an opportunity. What By driving these uh, attachment rates of batteries, we're really going to uh, create a future long-term sustainability of the grid. And really, we're going to see a much more higher attachment rate of batteries, which is going to give more people resilience. So just understanding those concepts. Of course, um, you know, keeping lights on really is at the forefront of a lot of people's minds as they're deciding whether or not to purchase one of these systems. Home is a haven, right? We saw this during COVID. A lot more people are working from home. Existing infrastructure, the, the power grid really hasn't been invested in like it should to keep it up. Climate-related disasters. Now, I noticed on the news this morning that uh, I think the Southeast uh, and, and the South are experiencing some tornadoes and, and very inclement weather today. So I hope anybody from that area is staying safe. And if you are in one of those areas, maybe chime in and, and let us know if you're under any tornado watches. Electrification, everything is coming. And when I worked for an installer, we just didn't put solar and a battery on your house and then run back to the van. No, we had larger conversations with the homeowners about installing heat pumps, EV chargers, uh, heat pump water heaters, and even um, um, uh, other, other electrical devices. Like, for example, your electric stove. We A lot of people love cooking with gas, 
Um, and I always would say you could keep the gas uh, stove. Why? Because you're not really using the gas stove that often. It's a relatively low amount of uh, gas that you're consuming. But something like a dryer, well, let's get you a heat pump dryer or an electric dryer to utilize that electricity. One thing that I'm really excited about uh, the new IRA and the new upcoming uh, tax credits is that now you can take a tax credit on just the energy storage system and not have to have it coupled with solar. So historically, I'd have to come out and put solar on your house and storage in order for you to qualify for that 30% tax credit. Well, now you can go out to a home and put just storage. And I always kind of, you know, thought about that is why would somebody want just storage and no solar? The batteries are only going to last as long as they have power and then they're going to go dead on you. So there is an opportunity. Some people don't want solar. Some people live in the trees. But if they can manage their loads properly, a, a standalone energy storage system will be 30% less expensive and still give you resilience. I could think of one example is that if we were able to use an existing generator and add energy storage, we can then, without solar, we could charge up that uh, battery bank using the generator for just running it a couple hours at a time. We're going to hear to talk about safety and, and one of the fundamental foundations of why certain batteries are safer than others is chemistry. Utilizing the lithium iron phosphate chemistry, but form factor matters as well. When you start looking at people's spec sheets and, and looking at their, their products, a lot of people call out that they're using lithium iron phosphate. But what you need to ask, and they don't usually publish this, is what form factor they're using. So if you were to open up a battery, what would you see? Would you see a bunch of little double AA, A, triple A kind of cylindrical cells, which is what uh, Simplify Power Briggs and Stratton utilizes? Or would you see the less expensive, kind of more likely to puncture or swell and contract pouch cells? Prismatic cells, there's, they're actually a pretty good uh, form factor, but what we tend to see is that uh, cylindrical, uh, prismatic cells have, tend to have uh, more cell volume. So when there is a thermal runaway event, we can see more venting of that gas. So cylindrical cell is a more advanced kind of manufacturing process. We have to spool those cells up and, and really uh, create that, that layering effect. You can see there on a the, uh, pouch cell that um, Nathan Heston, my coworker, is holding. That's out of his iPhone. You can see how that, that has swell, swell up. Uh, Will Prowse has a great YouTube channel. If anybody watches Will Prowse, uh, put that into the Q&A and give a shout out to him. Uh, he does some great videos where he, he demonstrates kind of these uh, runaway fire events. He takes a drill and kind of drills into these pouch cells and, and films what happens. So there's been a lot of uh, news, in, in, and this is a little bit older, some of these news stories, but what you see in some of these news stories is that it always mentions that there was a lithium ion battery fire. And they don't say that it was a, a cobalt based fire or an LFP based fires. So some of these really quickly, the top left is that nail puncture test that uh, Will Prowse shows in some of his videos. But there were some other examples of LG Chem really had a big recall. Uh, I know that they've moved on to a new technology. Uh, but also Tesla as well, where there was a, a three-day or four-day fire uh, that was caused um, down in Australia from, from some of these batteries. And I believe that was, um, it may have been a, uh, an ancillary uh, cooling system that wasn't commissioned properly, which caused that fire. So let's get, let's start talking about what we're here to, to talk about is the UL 9540A test method. Uh, and really what it was is UL developed this methodology uh, to conduct battery cell, module, unit, and even testing when you take a whole system and incorporate uh, fire mitigation strategies into that. And really what it's showing is, is that whether or not you have the unmitigated risk for uh, thermal runaway. And then what is used in this 9540A test, and remember UL 9540A is not a certification, it's simply a test that helps inform the 9540 uh, 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 certification. So what this happens in this test helps inform our instruction manuals to whether or know how far apart our batteries need to be spaced so that we're not seeing a risk from battery module to battery module um, uh, event. 
Now, I'm not going to go uh, too far into this because um, there's a lot of text on this screen. Uh, but on the right hand side, really, we all start out at the cell level and they take the cell, the battery, remember that cylindrical cell I was just talking about, and they subject it to um, this kind of uh, extreme environment, extreme uh, conditions that you might, you would never otherwise see normally in normal operation of a system. And as you progress through these tests, you move from the cell level to the module level, to the unit level and the installation level. And if you are able to pass uh, a given level, you don't need to uh, proceed down to the next level. So uh, there is actually a no cell uh, on the market at this time that can pass that, that first test. Uh, so everybody kind of jumps down to the module level and then the unit level. We were able to stop at the unit level testing because we were able to demonstrate that our unit by itself without having uh, external extinguishers or, or deflagration radiuses was safe and we didn't see an external flaming. And what this test does is it helps inform uh, us, the manufacturer and system integrators on the effects of that thermal runaway and the potential for fire propagation and or explosion. Uh, and then that helps us determine this, the spatial requirements uh, of the system. So there's code makers like the NFPA 855 out there that are creating codes to, to address these potential fire and explosion hazards. And part of these NFPA codes is to specify certain limits or a certain only, you can only have a certain amount of uh, capacity and energy storage in one location. And maybe you have to separate the energy storage blocks a certain um, spacing apart, maybe 20 kilowatt hours, and maybe to have them three feet apart. Well, what some of these new codes allow is that if you're able to show during a UL 9540A large scale fire testing that you were able to have more capacity in a given location and have the separation distances be less than what the original code are, you are allowed to, um, to not have to adhere to that or, or have a special certificate that shows that you do you are safe even with us closer spacings and larger amounts of volume. So it's a, uh, and then that's really the, the 9540A uh, test procedure, again, provides that data that we need to design a risk mitigation uh, to, to inform that. UL 9540 is that safety certificate standard. It's a joint US and Canada. And one of the other things that that uh, UL 9540 certificate also kind of allows is to make sure that when you are taking these different components and you're you're cobbling them together into a system that you're not introducing any unforeseen hazards or risks that may be generated by combining these other pieces of equipment together. The 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 system is being revised. Um, it's currently, I believe, it might be in another version at this point. Uh, but what we've seen in some of these uh, UL 9540A testing is that cobalt-based chemistries really see a higher instances of thermal runaway. We're seeing more fire propagation, right? That unmitigated propagation between modules and cells, the explosion. And we're seeing, frankly, more recalls on those batteries. Our LFP chemistry is, is really proven safer in test conditions and in the field. And that's really why I see a lot of other manufacturers moving towards this safer chemistry. These uh, uh, fire events really have uh, driven the understanding and the concerns. And that's why these NFPA conferences are so interested in having uh, the vice president of uh, energy storage, Sequoia Cross, come speak to them about this, um, this topic and create you know, uh, openness and transparency of that's what's happening. Again, it's bringing clarity to the industry and the code. It helps us gain uh, a perspective on how we can better inform insurance policies. Uh, insurance companies, I'm not sure if anybody is following. I'm from California, so I'm just going to talk California. But apparently, uh, there's insurance companies that are refusing to insure new homes in California because of that risk. So uh, as energy storage systems become much more common, right? I would say they're kind of uncommon at this point. Uh, we want to make sure that we're supporting the advancement of a safe and a secure and a sustainable energy storage system uh, for so these 
insurance companies and these fire marshals understand uh, what this test is doing and, and understand that this test is creating um, consistency across the manufacturers so that everybody is, is given the same test and put to the same requirements. Talked a little bit about this already, but I'll quickly run through it. 1642 is on the cell level. And as I mentioned, these are kind of the, the extreme kind of conditions that we subject the batteries to. Shock, vibration, uh, heating, uh, short circuit, abnormal charging, force discharge. Uh, and then if we're able to show that the cells didn't catch fire, essentially, we're able to integrate these cells in series and parallel packs into a UL1973 approved battery module. Again, we repeat those tests. And then the 9540A, that's when we really put the, the system into a, a, a large scale fire ses, uh, system. And then we use those, uh, what happens, what's called out in that 9540A test protocol to then inform our UL9540 system level um, spatial and, and safety requirements. Uh, and again, part of that was making sure that when we take somebody's inverter, a 1741 inverter, and we combine it with some 1973 batteries, that we're not uh, introducing unforeseen risks by combining those two uh, components. And it helps inform the NFPA. Right now, we do have uh, the certification on our BOSS cabinets with the Solar. And I'm going to show you some pictures here coming up on what that fire testing looked like. There's, that's the example of the, the battery cabinets there. The Boss 12 cabinet there has 12 of our batteries all in parallel. Uh, the Boss 6 has six batteries in parallel that would then go to an externally mounted solar and would be then covered under the, the 9540. So, Let's get into it. This, so uh, the UL labs, uh, the UL labs specifically that we sent our battery to is out in Illinois. And when I was down at uh, InterSolar the other month or earlier this year, um, I was talking to one of the UL uh, representatives and they were saying that they are seeing so much demand for these UL uh, test certificates and, and large scale fire testings that they've had to open up other additional testing labs. I mean, there's that many manufacturers that are needing to get these certificates, because otherwise, if you don't have these, you're one, not going to be able to pull a permit to install the system, or two, your utility isn't going to let you interconnect this energy storage system unless it has uh, your, your system on the, um, the approved list. What they did out in Illinois is they took one of our battery modules. Inside the battery, mo uh, battery module, you can see those are those cylindrical cells in this series and parallel configurations. We took two of the cells and basically did nothing to them. We, we were monitoring uh, two of the cells, even though it says unmonitoring, we really did have thermocouples on all of the cells. One of the cells uh, we heated and then some of the other cells kind of creating this U shape here, we additionally heated. We heated this kind of these, these eight cells or um, these seven cells here to the point that they went into a thermal runaway and caused propagation to the two unheated cells. And then we watched what happens. And we were able to generate uh, propagation in order to have a valid test. You actually have to show that it did propagate. But after propagation, what happened? And, and really the test results concluded that the batteries did not continue to create an unlimited thermal runaway to all these other adjacent cells, and there was no fire uh, ignition or an explosion. This is right out of the, the, the certificate that we generated uh, that the UL like issues to you when you obtain these certificates. And what are we looking at? Well, these are monitored cells, right? So that was that one cell that I was talking about monitored. There's the seven cells here, the additional six, and then there's cell seven and eight that are not heated that were forced into thermal runaway. And really what we're seeing here is a, a consistent temperature rise. This is the battery cells being heated in the lab. At this point, we see a venting occur. Now it's not a venting test. 
It's a uh, thermal runaway test. So we continue to heat the batteries to the point where they go into thermal runaway. The propagation occurs. And the, the kind of the, the point in this graph here is that it, it, ri it went up and then it dropped back down and we continue to, to drop down. This lower one, what you're seeing here is, is essentially the rear panel of the battery. And you can see it really didn't exceed 100 degrees centigrade on that side. What we're seeing here is the smoke release rate of the, the batteries and the uh, any volumetric flow rate of gases. So we were able to demonstrate uh, that we were able to pass at the module level. So what do we do? We progress up to the system level. And we took that same battery module with those same kind of upside down seven heated cells and two internal cells not heated. And then we took that battery module and introduced it into this battery cabinet. And we chose a, a spot to place this uh, initiating battery module in a location that would be probably the, the worst place that you would want the initiating battery module to be. We put it uh, in between, sandwiched in between two battery modules. We put it on a, not the very bottom shelf, but kind of in, in a lower middle shelf. And then here at the lab, they essentially put 93 thermocouples all around the cabinets, on the outside of the cabinet, inside the cabinet, inside the battery module, on the outside wall of the test chamber or the, the test chamber's back wall, which would be your garage wall if you think about it. Uh, and then we measured and recorded all of those temperature rises, uh, any sort of heat transfer to adjacent battery cabinets uh, into a surface's exterior to the system, your, your homeowner's garage, really. This is what it looked like in the test cabinet. And what we chose uh, is to kind of pack these battery cabinets in as tight as possible. So what we chose was a 12-inch clearance between the units a one inch clearance behind the back wall, 36 inches in front of the unit for working clearances. And then we also specified that the test chamber should have an eight foot tall ceiling so that if you are gonna be putting these energy storage systems into say utility closets or, or kind of more confined rooms that it would be okay to have an eight foot ceiling uh, for that situation. We'll call that out in the instructions. What you're seeing is the initiating battery cabinet, is this one kind of on the back left? And it might be a little hard to see, but we cover the cabinet in cheesecloth. Uh, and this cheesecloth, uh, the idea behind that is that it will discolor if there is any smoke being released out of the cabinet, and then that can be recorded. So this is showing the location of all the different thermocouples. Kind of what I want you to pay attention to is this uh, battery module number eight here is the initiating module and uh, thermal couple number 56 here, uh, which is the one that's sandwiched in between the two batteries. So let's go ahead and, and take a look at the thermal couples labels here. Uh, thermal couple 56, again, I just called that out, is, is the thermal couple on the right hand side of that battery module. So what we're seeing here is the uh, results of when we took that battery module and we put it into the uh, battery system and then initiated that propagation to those two adjacent cells. What we found was that there was no module to module propagation. Uh, and the highest temperature we recorded was that 60 degrees centigrade. And that was thermocouple 56 we only saw 60 degrees centigrade is the highest temperature we recorded. And that temperature dropped off rapidly after the thermal event finished. The point being there is that that temperature isn't great enough to cause the adjacent module to go into a thermal runaway. Uh, the, the temperature rise was unremarkable. Um, the back wall only shows the five degrees uh, centigrade raise uh, in temperature. So that's really showing you that the in one of these kind of the worst situation that you could possibly force to happen, we really had to force this system into thermal runaway. Uh, you're really not seeing any sort of significant rise in, in the temperature. And, and let me just, you know, stop for a second and, and just, you know, when you're sitting down at the kitchen table or when you, the installer, are going out there into our neighborhoods into our communities and you're installing these energy storage systems, I think safety should be 
one of the topics you discuss with your homeowners. Of course, warranty comes up, pricing, uh, you know, how long can it last with the, the um, ability to, to run this, the home's loads. But just thinking about, you don't want to be the installer that, that made the news for putting in a system that went into one of these thermal runaways. Uh, so I think talking to the homeowners about what we're what you're learning about today, these UL testings, and we don't have to go in as deep, you know, just mention that there's there's certifications that the UL issues, just like your toaster, just like any other electrical appliance you have in your home. And if you look carefully at these certifications, it details exactly how safe, inherently safe, some of these energy storage systems can be. This is showing the smoke release rate and um, back wall temperatures on the system level. This is right out of the test report, uh, showing just that there are no flames observed and that there was no uh, flaming. So this is the beginning of the test. Uh, and it started three minutes in this recording. Three hours and 43 minutes later, that's the end of the test. and and there's really no difference in the picture. In fact, I thought they were the same picture until I noticed the timestamp on the video had shown that, that you know several hours had gone by. And, and that's what it looked like. That's what it's going to look like uh, in your homeowner's garage. What you don't want it to look like is that picture on the left. That is the picture on the left of our one of our competitors going through the exact same UL 9540A unit level test. And again, Right. The idea is, is that this test is consistent across all manufacturers so that the results and what happens can be applied to anyone uh, impartially. So in this case, uh, this person failed the system, uh, the, the system, unit level testing. So then they would have to progress up to the system level testing, which means that this uh, test chamber would might have to have um, extra drywall installed or maybe have to have sprinkler systems installed or active fire suppression systems, a built-in fire extinguisher. So this was really kind of proof in the pudding what it can look like and what it should look like. One of the, the things that I, we've noticed in certain jurisdictions and AHJs is, you know, these inspectors, uh, and I used to meet the inspectors a lot, right? They're going from uh, going to look at a water heater in the morning going to look at a deck in the afternoon, going to look at some building, you know, right after lunch. And then they're coming to you with this energy storage system. So the inspectors don't really know what they're looking at. You know, they're having to be an expert in everything. And, and a lot of times these AHAs or these jurisdictions, when it goes time to pulling a permit and you're introducing something a little new to them, they really want you to fill out a lot of paperwork. You might have to go to the fire department. That's that's their jurisdiction and talk to them a little bit about it. Well, what you can do is get these letters of understandings or um, these documents essentially that can help you accelerate the permitting process. So when you do come time to go to the, the, the city hall and pull the permit, the building department, that they already know exactly what you're doing and already have all of your stuff on file so they can go ahead and issue you that permit and then because you've had this good relationship with this building department, when the inspector doesn't show up to sign off on it, and hopefully the homeowner's not hovering over you, that you're able to um, um, pass the inspection easily and quickly. So one thing uh, I want to really encourage and show is that uh, the building departments have a right to see these test reports. And, and the, if the AHJ requires it or asks for it, they have to be given that documentation. What manufacturers don't have to do though is voluntarily share that information with anybody else. One thing that we here at Simplified Power Briggs & Stratton do do um, is we actively share that documentation. So if you wanna go right now onto our website, go to simplifypower.com, forward slash product dot, uh, dash documentation, you can pull up our test report. This is a this is kind of a screenshot right out of our uh, website and, and you can look up that test report. I kind of summarized it for you, but if you're somebody that really wants to read all the nit and gritty, feel free to download that. I, you know, 
feel free to share that with the homeowners. Uh, and so by being more transparent, excuse me, being more transparent and, and forthcoming with our results, uh, really we can help create understanding and safety in the insurance companies for the firefighters, for the first responders, and even for the, the homeowners. I, I really want to stress this, that we're not seeing um, the different chemistries or different form factors being acknowledged in some of these news reports that you're seeing about lith lithium ion battery fires being dangerous. And if the authors of some of these articles uh, were doing their due diligence, they would see that many of those battery fires are caused by cobalt based chemistries, maybe with pouch or, or even LFP with pouch cells. Um, so what we need to do is, is create transparency and help people understand that there's different risk profiles based on these chemistries uh, that were shown via these test uh, reports and evaluations. And with this new kind of industry, with these new energy storage systems, uh, when there is some sort of event, I'm not really seeing a lot of history, uh, historical data being recorded. And, and so one thing that these test reports can do is, is really create guidance um, and, within, and have something to engage with uh, li local fire services. So they understand what they're coming into. They can understand that these batteries do vent dangerous gas, uh, understand that these batteries can have propagation without oxygen, understand that really you have to cool the battery cells down to, to mitigate that propagation. Um, and then also understand that there can be a reignition, that even though you think you got the battery out, that can be smoldering and, and uh reignite you know the next day or that night after the fire I, i'm getting near the end everyone uh so and, and i'm going a little bit fast so make sure you start putting your questions in but if you got anything uh that you're interested in this was a great uh, quote um and i'm going to read it for everybody ul 9540 has requirements for what we want to see going on inside energy storage systems, said Ken Boyce, UL Senior Director for Principal Engineering Industrial. We look at making sure the cells are appropriately proven for safety and that they're being integrated into the system the right way. And we have the right software and hardware controls to govern the function, functional safety of the unit. So this kind of goes back to the, yeah, we need to see what happens during the thermal runaway event, but also we want to make sure that there's uh, software and hardware that are being incorporated and aren't introducing any unforeseen uh, tests, uh, any unforeseen risks. And I'll back up a little bit. Uh, during some of those UL uh, uh, tests, the 1743, they actually do test the battery modules with and without the battery management system intact to make sure that if for whatever reason the battery management system isn't there, which offers some protections, uh, you're going to evaluate any sort of risks. And, and holding true to our kind of the, the theme of this uh, talk is that even without our battery management system, we didn't see that unmitigated thermal runaway. If you're here, if you're listening, I know you're excited about learning. Uh, so please utilize simplifypower.com as a resource. One of the things we have are installation manuals, of course. One of the most valuable things I found was those integration guides. So I said at the beginning of the talk, our batteries are inverter agnostic, but you want to make sure that you program that old trace inverter, program that outback inverter, program the, the Schneider to treat our batteries correctly. Well, those integration guides tell you how to program that piece of equipment, usually in the order in which that equipment's asking for those set points. So you make sure you get it correct. So if anything, uh, print out the integration guide. Um, the how-to videos, of course, are great. Always warranty the, the, the system. Of course, your, your, the warrant, warranty still is valid even if you don't register it. But we, there's opportunities uh, when you do register the warranties for us to maybe choose you um, for a photo contest or highlight your company for the photo. Um, it helps us kind of vet your systems to, to keep, make sure if we see anything we don't like, we can help you out. Training calendar, look for upcoming trainings. One of the most exciting training calendars, uh, Nathan and I, we, we got new trainings coming out. One of the ones Nathan recently did was 
how to optimize solar uh, and energy storage systems. One thing I got coming up in early July is how you can take generators and energy storage systems and they can complement each other. We talk about two wire start, three wire start, load start, lo uh, low battery cutout voltage start, uh, how you can save fuel. So a lot of great topics. It's something uh, that we've seen in the off-grid industry forever, but uh, we're seeing kind of more common in the, the grid tied realm. Uh, IQ installer program, I love anybody to join that. And I'm gonna talk about that here in a second. With the acquisition of Briggs & Stratton, we can now leverage the Power Academy. So get your phone out, uh, go ahead and scan this QR code here, and it will take you to the Power Academy. You can also text LEARN to 33988, uh, or you could go to that web address you see there. When you do get onto the Power Academy, uh, there's in-person trainings. Uh, we'll actually come out to your facility. Hope We got a, a, a trailer with our batteries, with our energy storage systems, with our generators in it. We'll come out and train up you and your crews. We do live virtual trainings, just like you're seeing now. But there's also self-paced recordings, which I always found useful. Imagine if you're uh, you know, just doing lunch or it's in the evening and you can't make it to one of these live trainings, uh, you can do a self-paced training. If you are gonna, if you do find yourself on uh, Power Academy and you're not a Briggs & Stratton dealer yet, uh, go ahead and, and enter in your email, enter in your information. And then when it asks you, please select the group you are most closely associated with. Well, if you click a dealer or distributor or install, it's gonna ask you for your dealer number. If you're not a dealer, you don't have a dealer number, go select rep group. Rep group is this one right down here. And then enter in your company name. And that's going to allow you to create an account and get into Power Academy. The IQ program, which I said at kind of at the beginning, allows you to go ahead and put up uh, uh, on the maps. Let's go ahead and qualify. We got some, some money. Okay. So if anybody's here for their NAPSEP credits, there's the email, training at simplifypower.com. Uh, please email me your full uh, first and last name. Spell it out for me on the uh, certificate so that uh, on your email so I can get it correct on the certificate and we can move forward. Uh, if anybody needs the, the copy of the slide deck, everyone's going to get a recording of this. Um, and if you want to copy the slide deck, go ahead and send me an email. Um, we are going to be, be so let's, let's do some questions. Uh, we are going to do some training on the energy storage system. That That is usually on our uh, Chemistry 101. One thing I do want to see coming up is we're going to start to um, do more training on, on sizing these systems. So when you are trying to sell any energy storage system, uh, and I hope you're selling the, the Simplify Power energy storage system, that how do you how do you talk to the customers? One kind of good approach has been packages. So of course, everybody wants whole home backup till they hear how much money it costs. Uh, so by selling packages, good, better, best, we're kind of able to, to provide these systems. So uh, we're gonna definitely stay tuned for upcoming trainings on, on designing these. Uh, so somebody is asking, let's see. Um, since you mentioned cylindrical cells are safer than pouch and prismatics, uh, we know that this, this is deed for true, but some LFPs in cylindrical versus pouch versus prismatic are a big concern since LFP doesn't swell nor thermal 108 nearly as much as cobalt cells. That's that's a great point. So, uh, and, and the point being is that when you had a cobalt-based chemistry that uh, could induce kind of a, a really dangerous thermal runaway, uh, having cobalt-based chemistries in a cylindrical cell, right? Think about a cylinder. It, it's a very um, strong structure, like a, like a propane tank is a cylinder, right? So if you had cobalt in a cylindrical cell, it was able to contain that. Whereas cobalt-based in a pouch cell or prismatic cells, they, um, they can really uh, swell or, or catch fire and, and really spread. But when we have an LFP chemistry, LFP doesn't tend to swell as much or have that, that thermal runaway as much. So the, the importance of form factor it isn't as important when you have LFP cells. Uh, but I would say you know that when you see high altitude environments, uh, cylindrical cells are gonna provide more rigidity 
Um, and so there are still advantages to heat dissipation. Uh, prismatic cells, true, you, you, you don't have that swelling. You can still have it a little bit, but the cells tend to be more uh, cell volume. One thing that I do is, is price point is becoming more of an important factor in our industry. And when you're utilizing cylindrical cells, your price point's greater. So there may be opportunities to utilize some of those other form factors to get your price down, but still be in a safe battery uh, form factor or a safe battery system as well. So, so great stuff. They're, they're not as big of a concern. Great point. Uh, I, I like that word unmitigated. Um, what is the max kilowatt and kilowatt hours uh, you can back up uh, in a system? That's really going to depend upon uh, individual systems. Uh, we can go up to nine inverters um, and, and up to over really unlimited amount of kilowatt hours in energy storage. Uh, so that's going to be um, a system specific. Yep. Um, if you have, if you're interested in any field service groups in, in Texas or any of that, or, or looking for anybody, please go ahead and, and email me directly, training at simplifypower.com. That's it. Thank you everyone for uh, attending. If you're looking for NABSEP, please go ahead and email me and we'll see everybody next time. Thank you so much.